All right, welcome back to the JFK assassination audit um, number, what would this be, number 60. And I guess we're going over Gadot or Godot or whatever its name is, so we'll call this one the Gadot episode. Um, also, it's uh, 15 February. Okay, so we're going to get in, like I said, we're doing these, um, the first sections on uh, embassies around the world, you know, what we can spot at them and trying to get an understanding of how the, the the host country or the CIA would be monitoring uh, an enemy or some a foreign embassy they want to monitor, even in other countries. And so we're going to look at, let's see, we looked at the Russian, the Cuban, the Chinese. Now we're going to look at the um, Iranian embassy and uh, in Mexico City. Now, to kind of get an idea, this looks like it's over in the hills here, the Southwest Hills. Uh, just orient ourselves, the Cuban Embassy is about right here. Oswald was staying over in here, this area. Russian Embassy was kind of down in this area here. And I'm not even sure where the U.S. Embassy is. I'm not even looking for that. But let's take a look. We're gonna get a little God's eye view here and come down on it and take a look and see what we can see. Hopefully this will be the location of the embassy. Um, okay, so yeah, it does look like there's some kind of location here. While this is going to be huge, complex if it is, wow. Let's see, hold on a second. So yeah, it it's going to be pretty huge. So maybe this whole area here. Again, I don't even know if this is the Iranian embassy, but anyway, we'll take a look here. Um, so that's kind of the God's eye view. We'll take a look at the inside here, what we can see. Yeah, that's the Iranian embassy. So 2350. 2350. Hold on one second. Yeah, so it looks like it's about right there. All right, let's take a look at these uh, photos. Looks like it's got a pretty high wall there. Not sure what that's about. That looks like the entrance. Not sure, again, I'm not sure what that's about either. Visiting hours. There's another street view. There's another view. All right, let's go back to that street view. All right, so this is another entrance to it. Let me see here. This looks like a very unused portion of the embassy. See how it's almost overgrown? And if somebody's using it. You see how it, it's worn here. But I don't see any cameras unless that's a camera. It's pretty poorly maintained. But yeah, you can see they got the the fencing here. They got the shrubs to keep people off the wall. Um, let's go down a little bit. Maybe this is just a side. Maybe that's like the maintenance entrance. Yeah, that's probably the maintenance entrance. All right, so there we go. Yeah, so you can see how they've got the reinforced walls here. Um, let's go back a little bit. Not very well made. You can tell the difference in the security, you know. 
This looks like the entrance for the vehicles. Notice how the wall isn't as high. I mean, you could almost hop on top of this wall here. <laughs> Very interesting. They got cameras, of course. Um, I guess the Iranians don't consider themselves a target. You know, it's not like... I mean, think about who the Iranians' enemies are, okay? Well, you got Saudi Arabia. Um, but I don't think Saudi Arabia, Israel, or the United States are going to be blowing up bombs in Mexico City to take out the Iranian embassy no matter what what they do. You know, they'll leave that for the battlefield. And see, that's how you can tell the difference between a terrorist country or a terrorist organization and a legitimate law-abiding country. Because a legitimate law-abiding country is not going to blow up car bombs in some area um, that's going to risk injuring civilians, except, you know, when we do those drone strikes in enemy countries. And you can see this is just, they they blocked it down to one way, they put some really lightweight looking <laughs> potted plants there. So someone will it'll make it a little more difficult to punch through there. Um but yeah, it's pretty pretty crappy. You can see the security office here. But again, you could just hop over that fairly easy it seems like. Um but anyway, so there's not a lot going on there with that embassy. This may be more of it. Maybe a consular view. Let's go down a little further here. Yeah, and this is some kind of business here. Let's see what this is. Oh, look at that. No cell phone usage. Huh. Now, that's the Swiss Embassy right there. You can see how their setup is. Look at that. Complete blast wall. We've got an iron blast gate there. Anyway, I don't want to talk about the Swiss, but the reason they're saying no cell phone usage is because, you know, a lot of people use. A lot of terrorists use cell phones to set off bombs and st remote bombs, stuff like that. Let's go on down the other way. Take a look here. So you can tell the difference between a much more sophisticated, richer country and a poorer country. See, here's another gate with another exit there. I think that's about it, actually. All right, so we'll go in to the next part here. Hold on one second. Like I said, there's not going to be a lot of winners. They're not always winners. Um, again, the the amount of security and sophistication and the way it looks is going to depend on the threat, um, the stature of the country, and then their, you know, their economic power and stuff like that. Now, I will tell you one thing. We'll get to this when I get to Washington. Um, the When Carter closed down the Iranian embassy in Washington, D.C. in 1979 because of the Iranian hostage crisis, it sat there boarded up for a while. It looks a lot better now, but in 1984, when Ronald Reagan was president, I went to Washington, D.C. A bunch of group of high school kids went up there, and uh, we went to the Iranian embassy, and, you know, we showed our American respects at the Iranian embassy uh, by going up to where the door was, where it been, had been boarded up. And, you know, when we had one guy watching out, the rest of us were taking a piss on the, on the door of the Iranian embassy. And the way it smelled, apparently we weren't the first to think of that idea. Uh, but anyway, so let's take a look at more Sylvia Odio videos. Hold on a second. So we listened to this little thing about on the news. Um, I haven't seen this, but this is Sylvia Odio, 1993, 1978. So we'll, we'll take a listen, see what this says. On September 25th, Oswald disappeared from New Orleans. 
All right, so this looks like, let's see. This is from Vince Palomara. He's pretty good. He's got some good stuff. Um, he put this up here. Oh, good. It's got Annie, Sylvia Odia's sister, that also heard and saw uh, the people there. Now, let's see. What did he just say? September 26th? September 25th. Oswald September 25th. From New Orleans. All right. Let's take a look at our timeline and see if that matches up. Hold on one second. All right. So it says on September 25th, Oswald disappears from New Orleans. That's not exactly true. I mean, Oswald was seen um, cashing his unemployment check at the Winn-Dixie um, at 4303 Magazine Street. So what they're doing is they're in, inferring, okay, that Oswald, um, after he cashed the check, left that night. But it actually it says early in the morning on the 26th that he left and boarded a bus for Laredo. Anyway, we'll keep going. Where he was that night is still one of the intriguing mysteries of his life. There is testimony that sometime between 7 and 10 p.m., he made a call to a leader of the Socialist Labor Party in Houston. The Warren Commission believed Oswald took a bus from New Orleans to Houston, but there are no records to confirm that conclusion. Meanwhile, more than 200 Meanwhile, the Dallas, Dallas, the, the bus says Dallas. Yeah two Latins and an American, showed up unexpectedly at the doorstep of three young Cuban exiles whose father headed an anti-Castro organization. All right, let's take a look here. Hold on one second. So it says somewhere on the 26th or the 27th, Sylvia Odia says Cubans and Leon Oswald came to her house. Um... But it also says here that at that same time, Oswald was in Laredo, Nuevo Laredo and boarded a bus for Mexico City. So he was on his way to Mexico City. So it obviously wasn't Oswald that was with this group of Cubans. Let's take a, let's take a listen here and see what Sylvia Odio and her sister Annie say. Hold on one second. Sylvia and Annie Odio granted Frontline this rare interview. One night I opened the door for three men that came to see one of my sisters. I opened the door. They were in a small hallway with bright lights overhead. The taller man introduced the other two men. Leopoldo, he said that was his name. Um, he introduced the American who was in the middle as Leon Oswald, and he introduced the one that seemed Mexican and spoke with the Mexican accent as Angelo. And are you quite clear about this, that when those men visited your apartment, the American was introduced as Oswald? The American was introduced as Leon Oswald. That would always be in my mind very clear. According to the Odeo sisters, Leon Oswald said nothing as Leopoldo and Angelo asked for help raising money for the anti-Castro cause. Suspicious, the Odeo sisters declined, but a half hour later, the three men drove away. And I think it was two days after that, uh, Leopoldo, who had clearly a Cuban accent, called me on the phone, and um, he um, tried to be very friendly on the phone with me and was trying to sell me the idea uh, of the American. Uh, the first thing that he asked was, what, what did you think of the American? And actually, I had not formed any opinion of the American at the time. He said, well, you know, he is, uh, we don't know what to make of him. He's kind of local. Uh, he's been telling us that uh, the Cubans should have murdered uh, or should have assassinated uh, President Kennedy right after the Bay of Pigs, and they didn't have any guts uh, to do it. They should do it. And uh, it was a very easy thing to do at the time. The reason that I remember so, so clearly was because that same night, or I think either that night or the night afterwards, I wrote my father. And I also um, told a friend of mine, who was my father confessor, about the visit. Odio talked to Father Walter McCann after the phone call from Leopoldo. So you got two people that were present that saw these, what, three Cubans, two Cubans, and... 
a guy going by the name of Leon Oswald. Okay, so they're laying the groundwork. Okay, while Oswald is out of the country in Mexico, someone's faking Oswald. This wouldn't be the first time. Okay, and they're laying the groundwork that Oswald's a little crazy, and that he may, you know, they should have. He said, "They're saying Leopoldo's saying that Leon said they should. The Cubans didn't have any guts. They should have killed Kennedy back after the Bay of Pigs." Okay, and so again, you have to ask yourself, who is this group of people? Okay, what are what is their purpose? Why are they coming to her and laying this information down? And what they're doing is they're planting seeds that she's going to do exactly what she said. She told her father, she told this priest uh, here, a confessor, and then she's going to tell the Warren Commission. The question you have to ask yourself is why doesn't the Warren Commission try to open this up and find out more about these people to find out if there was any kind of conspiracy? Because it's obvious that someone is setting up Oswald and conspiring with others to do this while Oswald is in Mexico City. That's a definite big sign of a conspiracy right there. I mean, it's almost like, you know, if... Well, I'm not going to give another example. This is just crazy enough. But we'll just keep going and hear what they have to say. I think I can pin a date to this conversation with Sylvia. It was the day in which uh, I spoke to her about her attending a, a charity event at which Janet Lee was going to appear in Dallas. If Father McCann is correct about Janet Lee, then the three men must have visited the Odeos two days earlier on September 25th, the only night Oswald could possibly have been in Dallas. But it could have been the 26th when Oswald was away. Wait, wait a minute, hold on. What did he just say? Possibly have been in Dallas. only night Oswald could possibly have been in Dallas. Although Oswald was in was in New Orleans. <laughs> anyway. They were trying to sell me the American because they spoke that he was a marksman, that he had been an ex-Marine, and that he was uh, someone who could be used and who could be an asset to any organization. Leopoldo and Angelo have never been... You see... That tells you there's a conspiracy involved, and it tells you, like I said, that either Liebler, who interviewed Sylvia Odio, was either very ignorant or he's lying and very deceptive and trying just to pin it all on Oswald. Because there's another one there. Okay, he's a Marxist. There's, you know, this is all identifying Oswald. So whoever this person, this group is, they know about Oswald. They've been given information about Oswald. Okay. They know he's in the Marines. They know he's a Marxist. All these kind of things. So they're trying to paint Oswald for later on. Because see, let me let me just go back here and show you something. Okay. So this occurs on the 26th, 27th. Okay. Oswald is left by early the early morning of the 26th. Okay. That morning, in the Dallas News. They first reported that to announce that Texas, um, the Dallas News is the first newspaper to announce the Texas visit in an article covering the President's conversation tour in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So they're the first to announce that the President will be touring Texas. It says here on the 25th, late in the evening, the White House sources an exclusive to the Dallas Morning News announced that the President will visit Texas in November. 2122 and that the tour will include Dallas. So once they know, so he, this is what you have here. You got sources in the White House, sources in the news, and once they get the word confirmed that the president's going to be in Dallas on the 21st, 22nd, they they automatically kick into gear, okay, send Oswald to Mexico, do a fake Oswald saying he's crazy and he's a Marxist and a Marine. So they can start painting him, you know, as this crazy person. They knew before that the president was going to go on some kind of tour, swing to the, the south, probably Texas, okay, because that's where LBJ is from.
but they didn't know the specific dates. But as soon as they get the dates, boom, they kick into gear. Oswald, you know, puts his, let's see, we'll even back it up here. Let's see here. Yeah, two days before, he puts his wife in the car back to Dallas. Now, again, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know the president's coming. He doesn't know that they're going to frame him for shooting the president. He's just following orders. And once they iron out the dates, then they start all the mechanisms kick into gear to frame Oswald. Let's keep going. Been identified, and the meaning of this incident remains elusive. If Oswald was there, was he infiltrating another anti-Castro group, or was someone setting him up to take the blame for the Kennedy assassination? There you go. Before he settled in Dallas, he paid a strange... So again, you just got to ask yourself, why isn't Liebler further investigating this? The FBI was investigating Lorraine Hall and all, you know, all these other guys, Patrick Hemming, uh, all these other people, okay, with very little to indicate that they, you know, were involved in the conspiracy. But Liebler doesn't further investigate who these people are. How, you know, my question would be, well, how do these people know your address? Do you, have you ever seen these people before? Do you know the names of these people? She gave some names, first names. Do you know how to contact these people? Do you have a phone number, address? Do you know where these people are connected with? And again, it all goes back, it sets, you know, it, it all goes back to this Cuban group, this anti-Castro assassination group, okay? But Liebler just cuts it off and says, no, it, it wasn't Oswald, because Oswald was in Mexico City, so then he leaves it at that, boom. But he doesn't make the next logical step that, hey, maybe there was a conspiracy to set up Oswald. I, it doesn't make any sense why you wouldn't reach that cons conclusion by this, by what happens right here. Uninvited visit there to this house, the home of a woman named Sylvia Odio, a well-to-do Cuban exile. Mrs. Odio recalled the incident in an interview in which she was reluctant to be seen recognizably. I was visited by a man and uh, two other men, but specifically Lee Harvey Oswald, even though he introduced himself as Leon. Harvey Oswald at the time. You have no doubt at all in your mind now or then. And and let's not forget that Perry Russo, okay, just like weeks before, or no, I think it's after, right after this, I mean within like a couple of days, goes to a party in New Orleans, okay, and is introduced to a Leon. Leon Oswald, okay, and then he recognizes that person as Lee Harvey Oswald. That this was Lee Harvey Oswald? Oh no, not at all. He was Lee Harvey Oswald. In Mrs. Odeo's living room, Oswald and the two men, both Hispanic, told her they came from New Orleans and asked her to finance certain anti-Castro activities of theirs. She declined. Nevertheless, the next morning, she received a phone call from one of the visitors. It was from Leopoldo, which was a tall guy. And uh, he told me what, the first thing he said was, what do you think of the American? And I said, well, I didn't think very much. I didn't make an opinion. He says, well, you know, he's kind of loco. Loco means crazy in Spanish and kind of nuts. And uh, he has, he's a Marine, an ex-Marine. He's an expert marksman. And uh, he would be a tremendous asset to anyone, except that he said, um, you never know how to take him. You know, he can go either way. So I didn't know if he was trying to sell him. To so that right there, what she just said to me, legitimizes that what she is saying and what she heard is true. Because you notice how she almost repeats it word for word what she says in the other interview. Almost everything is exactly the phrasing, the statement, the first to the last statement is almost exactly the same. So that to me says she's repeating something that was told to her that she heard. 
which makes it true. To me, or he was trying to get an opinion from me. See what I mean? So, uh, this guy, Leopoldo, insisted that uh, the American had said that we Cubans should have shot President Kennedy after Bay of Pigs, that we didn't have any guts, and that we should do something like that. So immediately I realized that there was an assassination idea or plot. You see, and so she would have said those words to Liebler, okay, back in 1964. She would have said immediately I would have realized, I realized there was an assassination plot back in September of 1963 before Kennedy was assassinated. So don't you think Weebler, if he's using his thinking hat, would have figured that, oh my God, what she's saying is that someone was a, a group of people were planning to assassinate the president and they were trying to paint Oswald as a crazy person. And then, but my sources say that Oswald was in Mexico City. So there was a fake Oswald that was with them. And they were trying to set up Oswald before he, in, when Oswald didn't even know what was going on. So logic says that there was a large, some kind of large assassination program going on, or conspiracy. Anyway, so that's enough of that one. Let's see what else we have here. Hold on one second. Now this one's really interesting. This is like, um, um, a podcast about Mexico but in this podcast they talk about Oswald in Mexico it's called Mexico unexplained and this is just one of their episodes but man this guy even though he does uh, um, a podcast just about Mexico oh my god he nails it I mean I've, I've I'm gonna have to actually do research in some of the stuff he's been saying in this so we're gonna go through this and stop along the way and try to verify what he's saying because man it's only 31 minutes but he packs a lot of shit in there it's amazing all right so let's take a look and we'll go on this about another what uh 15 minutes or less I wanted to see this now. I can't see this map very well. It looks like a map in Mexico. But I don't know. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can get a magnifying glass on my screen and read this. Because this is some kind of top secret report that he throws up here. But I don't know what it is. So let's see what this is. Okay. All right, so I'm looking on my thing here, and it says, it says, photographic surveillance operations allowed us, allowed at, oh, aimed at the U.S. diplomat, the Soviet diplomatic compound introduction in Mexico City CI station, um, uh, something, photographic surveillance at the Soviet diplomatic compound. Remember we were looking at that earlier and I was showing you some positions where they could have been doing that for. In Mexico City in 1963, three photographic sites or bases were used in this operation. So you remember I was telling you there would have been one at, pointed at the front gate, one at that side gate, and then you have that other, you know, you have the north gate and the south gate. So that's a three places that they would have um, cameras and maybe people sitting there taking notes. Um, three photographic sites or bases were used in this operation. The primary objective of the operation was to photograph people who visited the Soviet embassy. The operation generally covered the, does that say, oh the main gate of the Soviet compound between 900 and 1800 
or dark. So that's what nine o'clock to six o'clock, I guess, when they're getting diplomatic people come through on weekdays and from nine to fourteen thirty on Saturday. I believe Oswald showed up there on a Friday or Saturday, right? Physical positioning of surveillance bases and targets. So we're gonna have to look at that. I don't know where you got that document. That's pretty good. But yeah, see here's that okay, here's the compound. Okay. And remember we got this main street and it splits off here. And remember that main gate is right there. There's another gate right here. And there's another gate there. Remember I was showing you there's a uh, a building here, a newer building. They probably had an older building. And they got this bigger brand new building here. Um and then they yeah, see they have a location here and here. So let's see what this says. It says limited primary photo base on the first floor apartment you remember and see now this is the kind of person I am I would be against them releasing this to the public even today I mean not the map but the location of the camera source because they're probably still using that camera source even today so I, I would be a person that would be against them releasing that information. But again, it's right exactly where I said, almost exactly where I was saying. It says, Le something second photo base located in the second floor apartment. All right, so hold on one second. All right, so let's reorient ourselves here. So this is the Russian compound right here, okay? There's the embassy, the old building. You got the front gate here. There's another side gate here. And there's another gate or entrance approximately right in there. And so what they're saying, according to this paper video, okay, is that you had a camera position here and a camera position there. So exactly where I was saying, you'd have one there and you'd have one right there. And we'll go on Street View and take a look at that. I mean, I totally nailed it. I mean, I was right on it. So let's see there. And so they're saying on the second floor, second floor right there. Yeah, exactly. And that makes sense. You see how they've trimmed the hedge? You see how they trimmed the bushes here? There's no tree blocking. And then they've made sure to trim this tree back. You see how it covers that one, but it doesn't cover here. So they'd be watching from this floor. I would actually be watching from that floor. And here's something that's confusing. You have to be careful. In America, okay, it goes first floor, second floor, third, fourth in almost every building. In other countries like Latin America and in Europe and Asia, sometimes this would be the M floor or G floor. And then this would be the first floor, that would be the second, and that would be the third. So it can be lead to a little bit of confusion when you're reading and not having context. So remember that in America, this would be the first floor, second, third, fourth. But in other countries, most other countries, you'd have an M floor, the main floor, or the G floor, the ground floor. This would be the first level, they'd call it, the second level, the third. And that makes sense if you see how these windows are more opaque than these windows here. This has some kind of artwork in the window there. So that makes sense that you would have that right there. You can see this is some kind of bathroom window. You see how it's raised up a little bit. So that makes perfect sense. Now the other location, okay, is going to be, so there's a street. And it says, let me see if I can read this. On the first floor, right here. So the other location, I nailed that one too. You see how they've trimmed or, or uh, thinned the bushes here, okay, or the trees. You see how these are thicker, these are thicker. These trees probably would have been, you know, 
about down to here 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So on the first floor, again, you're not going to have surveillance on the street level because you're, you've got cars in between. So you're going to put it up. This is the first level or the first floor. So they're going to have cameras right in here. And that's a good location because if you look, let's, let's do something here. Hold on a second. Okay, there's, there's that floor right there. You see how they've got the shutters, the opaque window. Probably taking pictures right out of that. Perfect. Fantastic. But let's flip it around take a look. See, look at that. If you're up higher, you got a perfect view of the gate. You can get everybody coming and going. Makes sense to me. All right, let's keep going. Now this, we got about nine minutes for this one, so this one's really good. That actually looks like, nah, that's another old photo of Mexico City. That's Sylvia Duran, right there. She was Welcome to the Mexico Unexplained, where we will explore the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. This series presents information based partly on theory and conjecture. The podcaster's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bitto. Second. Now look at this one. This is very interesting. So... This is Oswald, okay, on August 9th. Okay, he, he leaves, he's, he's unemployed. He got fired, what, end of July? So he's out there passing out flyers, paying people to pass out flyers, and he doesn't have any money. And then he's, instead of just paying his fine or whatever, he decides to go to jail and then talk to an FBI agent. Now look at the photo of him there. You see that? Again, he looks like a soldier to me. Look at that. He's clean shaven. Clean, nice little cut. He's not some scruffy little Llewellyn type beatnik hippie, which is what they were saying. They saw him, like, what, a couple of weeks later? But also, let's take a look. You see that photo? And then look at that photo. He looks a little different, huh? Looks, it looks like he's a little fatter in the face. I don't know if that haircut's exactly the same. Hold on a second. I mean, we're only talking, let's see, August. So September, October, November. Three and a half months later. That's how he looks in August. And that's how he looks in November. To me, what that looks like, you see that expression on his face? That looks like a heartbroken man right there. That shit. I gave it all for my country. I'm on, I, I did the, what I was told. I followed orders and now they got me they got me here in jail and accused of killing the president of the United States who I actually admire and like. And that expression right there tells you that fuck these same people that I trusted that I was working for that I thought we were all working on the same team turned around and screwed me over and set me up and killed the president and blame, laid the blame on me. And he doesn't even know. This is the worst thing is that Oswald dies, is killed 48 hours later and doesn't even know that they've been setting him up since the very beginning. They made him into the patsy. That's a, a man 
that was confused but now realizes he's been fucked over. He was thought he was doing this for his country, make a little extra money for his wife and family, and then he gets screwed over and then he doesn't even know he's about to be killed. All right, let's keep going. Subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bitto. Welcome and muy bienvenidos to episode number 63 of Mexico Unexplained, where we examine the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. I'm your host, Robert Bitto. It is a tragic story familiar to most Americans and to many around the world. I don't know who that is. The date was Friday, November 22nd, 1963. It was a sunny day in Dallas when the motorcade of the 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, found itself in Dealey Plaza Morley. near the huh, Texas School Book Depository. At 12.30 in the afternoon, shots rang out and the young American president was killed. Within All right, we're going to stop there. And let me see here. 142. Let me write that time down. One forty two. Okay. So we're gonna go on to documents. We're gonna go back to Gadot. I'm gonna read this document here. Um Yeah, I'll get this one next time. Alright, hold on one second. So We've been seeing on these FBI documents, it says SAC. I kind of knew this already, but I wasn't exactly sure, so I looked it up. The abbreviation SAC is Special Agent in Charge. Okay, So all FBI agents are called Special Agents, and when it says SAC, that means they're in charge of that particular section. Okay, And um, so we'll see that SAC quite a bit. And so I found out some more information about George Gadot. Here's actually his burial plot on um, was his find a grave. And they got some good information here. It's a good picture of him. Um, he was born in 1908 in St. James Parish in Louisiana. Um, so in 1963, he would have been 55, not a young guy. Okay, looks like he died in Waveland. That's where we, we catch him up next is in Waveland. Um, even shows where he's buried there. Here's some more information about him. There's another photo of him. William Gadot, uh, William George Bill Gadot, Waveland retired journalist, died Monday at Hancock General Hospital and was 72. A graduate of Tulane University, Gadot started his journalistic, or journalistic career with the old New Orleans item. In 1931, he was editor of the English section of El Soy in Monterey, Mexico. So there's another Mexican connection. Gadot covered the assassination of Huey Long of Louisiana in 1935 for International News Services. Now, again, let's not forget that Gadot, so Oswald went to get his visa, you know, when you go in to apply for your visa, they're going to keep a record of it in the Mexican embassy, and they're going to get a visa issue number, and they're going to put down your name, and then the next person in line is going to get their visa number, and they're going to put down that name. Okay. So the only reason we're even talking about Gadot is because you got Lee Harvey Oswald. Of course, the FBI is showing the journal, excuse me, the Mexican consulate is being interviewed by the FBI. They're showing the, the record journal of the visas that were issued, and they show where Oswald was issued a visa. And then the very next person is George, or William George Gadot, okay, who just happens to be a longtime CAA contractor and journalist in all, touring all around Central and South America, Latin America, including Mexico. So think about it. If you've got a guy who only knows English and Russian, he, you're going to send him on his mission. He doesn't really know exactly what to do. Now, does Oswald know how to get a visa? Well, of course he does. He got a visa into Russia, so he would know how to do that. 
but does he know his way around Mexico City? Does he know his way around Latin America and Spanish? No, he doesn't. So what you want to do is you want to put someone either as a handler or a watcher for Oswald to get him in the right direction, get him going in the right direction, and make sure he stays out of trouble. That's what Gadot's doing. You know, they're not going to use some seasoned um, CIA agent. They're going to contract out with this guy. This guy's in New Orleans. Oswald's in New Orleans. This guy knows uh, Latin America, and Oswald's going to Mexico. This is a perfect, you know, perfect connection. And they can just get him over there, put him in line with Oswald. Either Oswald knows he's there or doesn't know he's there. Make sure Oswald gets that visa and does everything exactly correct. Keeps an eye on Oswald. Maybe even follows him down to Mexico City. Keep an eye on him. Okay? Who knows? I don't know. It says, after working at various newspapers and wire services, including the United Press and the INS, um, he was appointed by Nelson Rockefeller in New York in 1941 as the Executive Secretary for the Con Coordination Committee of Costa Rica. Okay? So basically what that is, before the CIA, we had these committees that we was set up that we could monitor what was going on in other countries, and they would report back to the State Department. Okay? One of the eight branches of the organization whose purpose was to enhance the war effort in Latin America. Now let's take a look at something. 1947-1908. So one of the reasons why Okay. Gadot is just a um, contract agent for the CIA and not a CIA agent because at the time the CIA was created in 1947, Gadot was already 39 years old. He's pretty damn old. Also, he's undependable. He's an alcoholic. He's got marital problems, financial problems. So he's not your perfect candidate, okay, for being a CIA agent. Okay. Anyway, we'll keep going. It says, following World War II, Gadot served as State Department press attaché in Latin America and later became a reporter in the region for U.S. News and World Report. He later published the Latin American Report, a newsletter that became a news magazine in 1956. Um, prior to retirement, Gadot became a correspondent uh, for the Sun newspaper and then later became a columnist of the weekend edition of the Sun and Daily Herald in Biloxi. Now it's interesting that the the CIA says the last time they used his service was in 1955 and then right after that he created this Latin American report so that kinda makes sense okay he's sending his young guys down to Latin America now contact this person contact that person report back and we're gonna put all this information together in little packets of information to give to the CIA you know so what Gadot is doing is the same thing that De Mornschill's doing, okay? Privatized intelligence reporting. Gadot's using his news service to do that. Uh, De Mornschill's using his Latin American connections and his geological oil connections, petroleum connections to do that, you know? Um, he's also doing the same thing that Bannister's doing. Bannister's doing more domestic stuff, okay, by trying to hunt down communist sympathizers in the New Orleans, Louisiana, in the South area. And he's reporting that back to the FBI. So you have a lot of private contractors here that are working for the CIA and for the FBI and then, you know, they can actually get more information that way. It says, uh, let's see, funeral services were held at 11 a.m. on Thursday from Christ Episcopal Church in Bay Street, um, St. Louis, Louis, St. Louis, oh, Bay Street, Louis, Bay, in, in Bay St. Louis. I'm not sure what that it is there. It says he will be buried in Cowan Family Cemetery in Bay St. Louis. Now, oh, Bay St. Louis is like a, a town in Louisiana. Okay. It says, wow, this is interesting. Uh, Washington, D.C., Thursday, January 15, 1976. Another JFK slaying riddle. Oswald CIA trails cross shadowy figures emerges by Norman Kempster. 
Washington staff star staff writer. Um, Senate investigators are trying to untangle a perplexing coincidence that links Lee Harvey Oswald with a longtime CIA agent who published a Latin American uh, newsletter as a cover. Now, he's not a CIA agent. He's just a contractor. For his intelligence work, the former contractor, William George Gadot, received a Mexican tourist permit with a serial number just preceding that of one issued by Oswald. Oh, so it's the one before. Okay. On September 17th, 1963, and about two months before the assassination of President Kennedy. Hold on one second. All right, and let's see. In the telephone interview this week, Dot, who is now living in retirement in Waveland, Mississippi, said he knew Oswald by sight uh, at the time. So it looks like that report we were reading actually came from this news article. Although he cannot recall if Oswald was with him in the Mexican consulate in New Orleans. Ask if he was sent by the CIA to the consulate to keep track of Oswald Gadot uh, responded, I was not. Uh, the Gadot matter is under study by Senator Richard Schweiker, um, Republican Pennsylvania, a member of the two-man subcommittee of the Senate Intelligence Committee, which is investigating the relationship between the Warren Commission and the CIA and the FBI. The commission, headed by late Chief Justice Earl Warren concluded that Oswald, acting alone, murdered Kennedy on November 22, 1963. Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby two days later. Um, Schweiker said he, the assassination investigation should be reopened because of new evidence that's been discovered since the Warren Commission published its report, and his own investigation was found curious intelligence fingerprints on the case. And of course. This is like 1976. By 1977, that's when the House Assassinations Committee starts really going. This is after that 1976 election. The Gadot matter seems to be one more of the puzzles that added to the controversy that surrounds the Kennedy assassination. The Warren Commission was told that Oswald went to Mexico City in October 1963. While there, he contacted the Cuban and Soviet embassies in an apparent uh, effort to obtain permission to go to Cuba. There is evidence that the CIA had Oswald under surveillance while he was in Mexico, although many of the details of his trip are still being disputed. Despite Gadot's insistence that his trip to Mexico had nothing to do with Oswald, the coincidence of the numbers raising questions that the commission apparently did not ask. It said, evidence supplied to the commission concerning Gadot is confusing and, and unless several widely Separated reports are brought together. It's impossible to tell from the facts of the documents that whether this FBI, uh, which served as the investigative arm of the commission, made the necessary connections. So you see how we're reading documents that were kept secret for over 30 years, 40 years, okay, up to the 1990s. So the Warren Commission wouldn't have access to these documents. Why wouldn't they have, have access to these documents? They're trying to keep it from them to cover it up. It says, Swiker has complained that the FBI often submitted documents to the commission without helping the members determine the significance of the papers. The commission apparently was informed that Gadot had received the tourist card issued just before Oswald, uh, but the published report gives no indication that the information was given more than a passing consideration, working only from the original Okay, so apparently the Warren Commission was told that Gadot was given his tourist visa right before Oswald, but they didn't explore it. Working only from the original published materials, it was impossible to learn the coincidence in the serial number. So apparently Gadot is leading Oswald through this whole process to get him into Mexico. So he's the handler. That's what we're talking about here. Gadot's newsletter operation was headquarters in, in New Orleans, and he said he frequently had been out, seen Oswald distributing handbills for the Fair Play for Cuba committee, a pro-Castro group outside his office. A pro-Castro group outside his office? Huh. Gadot said he knew Oswald by name and by sight, although he had never met him. 
He said he had frequently seen Oswald distributing handbills of the Fair Play for Cuba committee, a pro-Castro group, outside of his office. So, if I'm reading that correctly, what Gadot is saying is that his office was inside the international trademark where Shah was had his office. That's what he's saying right there. Just a coincidence, right? Gadot also expressed some opinions about Kennedy assassination that coincide with the views of some of the critics of the Warren Commission. Despite Oswald's rhetorical support for Cuban Premier Fidel Castro, Gadot said he believes Oswald was actually involved with a group of anti-Castro Cubans. See, there you go. Gadot was asked if he had formed any opinion about the Kennedy's, how Ken, why Kennedy was killed. The only possible idea that I could have would be that anti-Castro Cubans conspired to kill him because of the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs. Gadot responded, if I was an anti-Castro Cuban, there's no question I would have been very bitter about what had happened at the Bay of Pigs. So there you go. That's just nailing it right there. Gadot said he had no way of knowing if Oswald had contacts with the CIA because my work with the CIA did not involve anything within the United States. Of course. The report included the full text of the letter from the Mexican government listing the names, addresses, and much other information on the possibility of people who received card numbers 824082. Oswald received number 82085. No mention was made of 824084. So... Hold on one second. All right, so this one's interesting. It says, this is from the book, He Was Expendable, National Security, Political, and Bureaucratic Cover-Ups. Now, I entered this about the Mexican visa. We're going to get to that in a second. But it says, William Gadot, during an interview with Anthony Summers uh, in 1978, this is like two years after this news article here, admitted that he was associated with the CIA for 20 years. Uh, Gadot worked for the David Atlee Phillips in 1954 as part of the CIA effort to overthrow the Guatemalan government. Now, let's not forget, David Atlee Phillips became the Mexican um, operations chief there. And we also have the testimony of Antonio Vesiana. We're going to come across a little bit later that David Atlee Phillips, Maurice Bishop, okay, was, he saw him and Oswald uh, meeting in New Orleans. And if I remember correctly, maybe I got the names mixed up, but Maurice Bishop, David Atlee Phillips was also arrested on the same day of the assassination in Fort Worth. But anyway, um... It says, over the years, Gadot had provided intelligence to the CIA on Latin America and had a secret clearance from the agency. He also had a number of interesting and never fully explained connections to Lee Harvey Oswald on September 17, 1963. Oswald went to the Mexican consul's office in New Orleans to apply for a tourist visa to Mexico. On that day, Oswald applied for the visa. Five other Americans also applied for the visas. And the Warren Commission was informed by of all the names of the Americans except one. The unidentified American was the individual immediately before Oswald who had applied for tourist visa number 84. And the decision not to name the individual that applied was made by the FBI, which interviewed all Americans who had applied for the tourist visa that day. The Warren Commission reported indicated that there was no record for that call, which was untrue card, which is untrue. All right. So it's in 1972, the National Archives apparently by mistake released a portion of the commission document 75, which on page 652 showed that William Gadot had applied for the visa before Oswald and the FBI had suppressed Gadot's name because of his connection to the CIA. The FBI had strong interest in Gadot because it suspected he might be have been keeping a watch on Oswald for the CIA. Gadot was in Mexico City for the portion of that time. See, there you go. Gadot was in Mexico City for a portion of the time that Oswald was there, but his connections to Oswald did not end with his obtaining the tourist visa prior to Oswald. 
Gadot had an office in the International Trade Mart. There you go. In New Orleans, which is not far from Guy Bannister's office. Well, there's Clay Shaw right there. That's also where Oswald, he said he saw Oswald passing out the, the damn flyers. He also is known to have been visited Bannister's office in the summer of 1963. In a 1978 interview with Summers, Gadot said he had, he had known that he had known Oswald in New Orleans, but quickly changed that he had seen him handing out leaflets in New Orleans. In a second interview with Summers, Gadot stated that he had seen Oswald in the company of Guy Bannister and had also seen him with David Fury. He reported that Sergio Acarcha Smith also knew Oswald. Wow. So let's put together what we just figured out here. And I want to go to this section right here. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So it says right here. So you got Oswald getting his visa on the 17th. On six days later, Chief of Cuban Operations, also the the CIA station chief, which would have been taking those pictures in Mexico City, was David Atlee Phillips Maurice Bishop. Okay? And at the time, Phillips was working as under, the, yep, under diplomatic cover at the U.S. State Department and Embassy in Mexico City. Right there. But we'll go on down a little bit, and it says on the 24th, one day later, after. Let, let, let's see if you understand the importance of this, okay? So on the 17th, Oswald go gets his visa for Mexico. He's got a CIA handler, Gadot, who's on the v, who gets a visa before him. Six days later, David Atlee Phillips, who's the station chief for Cuban operations, has made the um, was working undercover in Mexico City there where Oswald was going to be going okay and that's on the 23rd on the 24th Antonio Vesiana okay says that he had been speaking travels to Dallas for a meeting with Maurice Bishop in the lobby of the Southland building Vesiana sees Bishop speaking to a man Vesiana later identifies as Lee Harvey Oswald Okay, and then we've got Oswald went back to New Orleans. He cashed his check later that evening. It was told by Dallas Morning News the president was going to go to Dallas. And then the next day we got this fake Oswald showing up, Sylvia Odios. So that seems pretty clear when you put all the dates together from different sources and all that information. It seems really clear what happened. Okay? Somebody in the CIA, whether monitoring Kennedy's office or conversations, found out that Kennedy was going to be touring the South and, and Dallas in November. Okay? This is what happened. After the 15th or the 16th, they're discussing it. They publicly put it out like a week later, but they're talking about it. Probably being brought up by Johnson, or suggested by Johnson. Connections in the CIA contact Maurice Bishop, okay, who's basically one of Oswald's handlers, and sets up this whole thing for Oswald to go to Mexico, and then they start painting Oswald as this crazy person is going to assassinate the president. He's seen by Antonio Vesiana. Okay. So that's pretty clear what's happening. So then they, you know, they're using Gadot to get that visa. Maurice Bishop is sending him on a mission. Here's your assignment. I need you to go to Mexico City. Shake him up down there. Tell him you want a visa to get into Cuba, Mexico, Mexico, Cuba, whatever it is. That seems pretty clear what's happening. Anyway, we'll keep reading. Uh, 
All right, that's a good book. Anyway, so there we go back. We'll go back here. It says an FBI report submitted to the commission but not made public until later. Said no record. Yeah, but yeah, this is how we found out. We just read that in the book. In a telephone interview, Gadot was bitter uh, about the FBI report. And see, this is why this statement I was reading last night we're going to go back to. They're doing this damage assessment, risk assessment on Gadot in 1968 or so, 67, to see if he can be trusted to keep his mouth shut about handling Oswald. Okay, because none of this has come out that he got the visa before Oswald in the public. Okay, the FBI knew about it, but they suppressed it to the Warren Commission. It says, if the CIA needed me to do a job, now that my cover's been revealed, I couldn't be any help to them, even if I wanted to, Gadot said. I'm useless to them. I couldn't go back to Central America. At 67, Gadot is unlikely to be called out of retirement. He now talks freely about an intelligence career that he had spanning 25 years beginning during World War II when he served as a special Latin American unit head by now Vice President Nelson Rockefeller. Oh, yeah, that's right. In case people don't remember, when Nixon, uh, Nixon got thrown out or resigned, Ford became president, and then Nelson Rockefeller became the vice president at that time until January of 19... From, so, let's see, Nixon resigned August of 74, and... Ford became president. Ford was president until January 1977, so Rockefeller was vice president from 74 to the beginning of 77. He said he had joined the CIA shortly after the agency was created in 1947 was, and continued until 1969. Now, again, Gadot, not at 39, was not some farm-trained CIA agent. He meant he started doing contracting work for them in 1947. Throughout his career, the CIA Gadot lived in a double life as a spy and as a journalist who specialized in Latin American affairs. He said he provided some information to the planners of the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. Hold on one second. I've got to save this, find a grave here. Hold on one second. It says Gadot was publisher of the Latin American Report, a newsletter that sold 15 for 15 a week to clients and I think it was 15 a month. To clients with an interest in the region. He also wrote the freelance dispatches for several U.S. publications, including the Miami Herald. Uh, his CIA connections apparently were not revealed to the publications that purchased his articles. Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, First National City Bank of New York, Standard Oil, could not decline to go into detail about his other financial arrangements with the CIA, and he said he had spied for patriotic reasons and not for the money that he received. During the years Gadot said he was working for the CIA, the agency frequently provided journalists cover jobs for its agents. CIA Director William Colby had said that since 1973, the agency has not employed as agents full-time staff members of major U.S. publications or broadcast networks, but he refused to rule out the use of employees of small specialized newsletters or foreign publications see now that's a good way to you know cover your ass but what he fails to remember is that especially in South America and Asia a lot of these news agencies they may have a, a front journalist they put up there but all that information is gathered researched and talked about found out about and then the information they're reporting about is actually coming from contract journalists people that are you know they're working a contract with that news agency okay but they're not like you know card carrying members of ABC NBC CNN stuff like that. that that's just not the way it works there it says, Gadot said the two biggest uh, customers for the newsletter, purchasing more than 20 subscriptions each, 
where the CIA and the Soviet intelligence, the KGB, although the CIA and the KGB each were paying more than 15000 annually for subscriptions, Gadot denied that the money amounted to a subsidy of his efforts. He said both agencies brought the letter of the information it contained. Other clients included the United Fruit Company. So just to give an example, I seem to remember there was a couple of journalists in Israel that were working for Israeli um, and even French and BBC news agencies, okay, that somehow got called out and were found out they were reporting back to intelligent services, you know, the CIA, Mossad, all those kind of other things, that other guy, remember that guy, uh, that Marine, Scott Ritter, who supposedly is working for um, the, UN, the UN, you know, to go after Saddam Hussein's um, weapons of mass destruction, he was found out to be actually working for U.S. intelligence, which, you know, I can't blame him. That's exactly what I would do. You find someone who's there, who's around what's really going on, and you get them to work for you. Or you send someone in that's working for you already into those situations, and you give them a cover. I mean, that's just that's the way the game's played. We do it, they do it, everybody does it. No big surprise there. I don't know why people get all shocked when they find this shit that's going on, you know? Anyway... Um, let me see here. We're almost done. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up because...